Okay, well, welcome everybody. Let me go ahead and change this to uh, speaker view and uh, welcome to uh, Solar Noon Tuesday. And as per usual, what we'll do is we'll walk through some of the news of the last week in, in the world of solar. And then we'll jump in with some announcements about webinars, events that are coming up uh, in the coming weeks. Then open it up to anybody who wants to bring up anything in the world of solar. And then I've got a um, topic, just uh, this, this week's topic, we're going to talk about um, panels, solar panels, what are the rated the best panels, what panels are the best selling for 2023. So jumping into the solar news. Um, so the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, or uh, affectionately known as NERC, is uh, announcing that they're anticipating that over the coming summer, we're going to see an elevated risk of widespread grid outages taking place this summer. This is largely due to climate change. Um, we've seen severe weather as the norm. And uh, also because a lot of the fossil fuel um, generating plants have been shut down and we're in this process of transitioning from fossil fuel to renewable energy, but the process has not always been overly logical. Um, many of the utilities are shutting down plants before the replacements have been built. Um, so the areas that are gonna be affected most according to NERC are Western United States, also Texas um, and uh, the Carolinas. Now, fossil fuel advocates have jumped on this saying this is a, a prime example of why the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy is a bad idea. NERC has come out and said, listen, this, this announcement is not intended to try and signal anything about the transition to from, away from fossil fuels. It's really just to say that it needs to be handled very carefully. And because of the increasing number of severe weather events, we're probably going to be facing problems this particular summer. The um, IRS has issued guidelines for the um, what constitutes domestic content within uh, for the IRA, the In Inflation Reduction Act. So the IRA has a 10% kicker for um, tax credits if you use domestic content. And this is all designed to try and spur the development of domestic uh, manufacturing of solar products uh, and manufacturing in general. Now, the guidelines do state that if it's iron or steel components, they must be 100% manufactured in the United States. Um, that means that they have to be melted and poured within the US. Um, apparently, according to the IRS guidelines anyway, the, the metal industries are used to these kind of terminologies, shouldn't be hard to comply with. Uh, they did say that the railing systems within solar probably likely are going to be under this category of 100% manufactured in the U.S. For the manufactured portion of the system, it's a little bit more complicated because what constitutes something being manufactured in the U.S.? For example, with solar panels, the three main component steps for manufacturing a solar panel is the um, mining of silicon. So if it is a US um, panel, does the silicon have to be mined in the United States? Then the silicon is manufactured into um, cells, solar cells, and then the cells are assembled into panels. So do the solar cells have to be manufactured in the US or is it just simply the assembly? Now, my reading of the first uh, draft here of the IRS ruling is that it is the assembly portion that they're looking at. So uh, you could take solar cells, import them, and then assemble them here in the US. And that's important because currently 95% of all of the solar cells that are available worldwide are manufactured in China. So um, to wait on a domestic cell industry to be developed might delay the implementation of this for a considerable period of time. So right now they're just saying that the assembly has to take place here in the US. Um, so, so that is designed to speed things along a little bit there. 
although I'm sure some people will think that that's um, a compromise too far. The Biden administration uh, just vetoed a bill that was presented to them that um, would have overturned the pause on tariffs from four Southeast Asian nations. Those four Southeast Asian nations are Malaysia, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand. And if you recall a year ago or so, um, they, there were, well, of course, many years ago, there were Chinese tariffs imposed. There were tariffs on imported Chinese panels. A lot of the production moved to those four nations. Then there was a lawsuit brought that said, hey, all they're doing is trying to avoid the tariffs. So uh, there was the expectation that there might be retroactive tariffs imposed upon this. Well, 80% of all of the solar panels in the US came from those four nations, which severely disrupted supply chains. So last summer, the Biden administration said, let's put a two-year pause on this whole thing. Uh, let's let the investigation run its course and then we'll worry about it. And in the meantime, they implemented the Inflation Reduction Act, trying to spur domestic production, hoping the whole problem would go away. Congress decided to step into things, and as they do, they made a bad problem worse. And so what they've done is they passed a um, uh, the bill that's um, by 221 to 202 in the House and 56 to 41 in the Senate, saying we want to overturn that pause. Well, the Biden administration vetoed it. Now that has to go back and get a two-thirds majority in order to override the veto, which it will not. Uh, in the meantime, the uh, Commerce Department is expected to rule on this whole thing, uh, and the date that they've set on that is August um, 18th. Okay, so uh, the projections for the growth of solar from the U.S. Uh, solar and wind from the U.S. government uh, missed the mark over the last three years by about 50%. So they under projected the growth of renewable energy by about 50% over the three year period. Um, today, renewables account for a bit over 27.5% of the generating capacity on the US grid. This is up from a little bit over 22% or up about 5% over the last three years. Um, so far this year, about two thirds of all the new generating capacity is renewables, wind and solar primarily. Uh, they do project that over the next three years, of course, this is the same agency that under projected before, they're saying about a third of all, so 33.46% to be exact, will be renewable um, within three years. And that means that natural gas will decline as a generating source from 44% to about 42. Coal will go from about 17 to 14, and nuclear will decline from about 8% to about 7.5%. Uh, there's a company called We Recycle Solar. They just announced they're expanding their uh, capacity at their Yuma, Arizona plant. Uh, they began operations in 2019, and they have processed so far about half a million solar pa panels at this facility. They've expanded this now to about 75,000 square feet. And uh, that, they say, meets about 25% of all of the current U.S. Um, demand for recycling of solar panels. Of course, this is going to increase rapidly over the coming years as a lot of these installed systems reach the end of their life, or if they're damaged in hailstorms, for example, or something like that. Um, this We Recycle Solar company has announced they do intend to quadruple their facility within the next five years or so. So this is something that we're going to be hearing more and more about. And that's the news that I had this week. Um, anybody else have anything they want to add to the mix? Any, any announcements, any news from anybody? Okay, well, let me jump into the announcements that I have here. Um, May 24th, we have um, a... Um, Webinar, 12 noon, 
Eastern time. All of these times I'm going to give you are Eastern. And as I usually say, uh, you know, look these things up online now that you're aware of them. But if you need to contact me, I can give you the link. It's probably quicker just for you to find it. Reuters is going to have something on Europe's response to the IRA on the 24th. On the 24th as well, you can jump from one webinar to another, um, transforming distributed energy resources um, from challenge to opportunity with distributed energy resource management systems. So this is really utility scale systems if you're interested in that. Cybersecurity also on the 24th um, is going to be a webinar there for you. And then um, I did receive um, a note from someone who's online here uh, often telling me about a uh, Ohio State series that's coming up. Uh, these, this, when I look through the materials, looks like it is focused on large uh, systems, specifically for the landowners of these large systems, uh, utility scale, um, solar development overview, uh, leasing land for solar development, some of the issues there. Connecting to the electric grid, once again, the interconnection problems that you may face, uh, solar project approval process in Ohio, and then there is a construction um, considerations and then actually post-construction considerations for these large developments. All of those are going to be offered through Ohio State, and uh, they all begin at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, Maria, which is the Mid-Atlantic Renewable Energy Association, has a webinar coming up on microgrids on May 30th. And then Renvu has uh, another uh, webinar on uh, smart electric panels. Uh, this is where you do load management within the uh, breaker panel box. Uh, and that's on May 31st at 1 p.m. Eastern time or 10 a.m. West, um, West Coast time. And then on June 6, 2 p.m., there will be a solar regulation and standards as it, as it affects, I think, microinverters is the primary focus on this particular one. And then there is an upcoming on June 15th, another one on microgrids, this one coming from Wood McKenzie. So those are the webinars that have come into my inbox here over the last week or so. So once again, I'll throw it open here in the pause to see if anybody's got anything they want to bring up for the good of the cause. This is your chance to uh, vent <laughs> on things. Um, while you're thinking, and if you, if you just jump in if you want, um, I wanted to vent on a thing I've been fussing with the AEP um, application form for uh, getting interconnection approval, and it is an extremely frustrating process. I don't know if anybody else has experienced, well, I've checked with a couple of people, and, and my experience is not unique. Um, the way that they have set this up for homeowners and people who are installing on homeowners in the AEP region uh, service area you go online, uh, it's a relatively complicated application form, but not something that you can't navigate through. They want you to give them a one-line drawing and a plan view and photos of where the connection is going to be and where the array is going to be. All of that is, is certainly doable. And then you submit it, okay? And, and that all seemed pretty straightforward. Well, then I was waiting and waiting on some sort of response, went back in after a couple of weeks to see that they had said, oh, now you need to submit something else, but we weren't going to tell you about this ahead of time. Uh, and, and it's the most bizarre thing. It's you've got to submit a request for signature. And as near as I can fathom, this thing is that you sign a document saying that you will pay the $50 that they now want for the application, but they don't let you pay the $50. They will then mail you a bill and then you'll pay for it. But they didn't tell any of this up front. But then the kicker is that process just doesn't work you cannot submit that form no matter what you do. And there is no way to contact anybody about this through their system. 
So, you know, in my mind, it's a it's a blatant attempt to just try and slow down the process, you know, to uh, make it unmanageable, frustrating, uh, because technically they can comply with what they're being to, told to do by the Public Utilities Commission, but they don't actually comply. Uh, now, eventually, I'm sure it gets worked through, but it's just a frustrating, annoying, bureaucratic, and illogical process, um, and it it is unnecessarily so. Okay, so that's my venting on that particular. Has anybody else had any any issues when they go in for these interconnection agreements that reinforce or dispute that? Yeah, it's just everybody's being very silent. Okay, um, we've had some issues. Okay, and were they similar in nature, or is it just you know that you just don't hear back, or it's it's complicated? Well, uh, we're in Connecticut, and I signed. I don't know if, if I should say the solar company or not uh, with them back in November, and it's May. It's still not put in. Uh, we just got the permit from the town finally, but the uh, interconnection was denied by the utility because. Uh, first, we hadn't gotten our energy audit, which was finally done this month because they were so backed up that we waited four months for that. Mm. And then um, in addition, they said that the size of the system we were putting in was too large. It was only uh, um, a 20, I want to say a 20,000 kilowatt system to cover 2,000 kilowatts a month. And then we just found out that the transformer on the street will not handle the size of that. So oh. now we're going between the solar company and the utility company, figure out who's going to take care of that and when. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it sounds like my annoyance is small potatoes compared to yours. <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and when you mention about the the size of the system. I don't know what the rules are in Connecticut, but in Ohio, you're limited to 120% of your consumption. Um, so uh, that's something that the interconnection will fuss about if, if they feel that you've sized it too large. But the one thing about the transformer size always confused me a little bit because you figure if they're delivering power to you, and the transformer is adequate, then how come power going back to them is, <laughs> is too much to be handled on their transformer? Right. Um, and, and the only reading that makes any sense to me on that particular item is if all of your neighbors have solar arrays as well, the same ones that are feeding the transformer, and, and there is that possibility that they may be generating to capacity um, greater than the capacity of that transformer, you know, backfeeding at a time when there's a lot of sunlight and very low consumption. So, you know, are your neighbors all installing solar? Is that something that, that seems like it could be happening? I haven't seen any on our street. We're in a rural area, so there's not too many neighbors but I have seen them in town. Oh, well, it would have to be the same ones feeding your transformer. Yeah, you know? We might be the first. Yeah, so that sounds like they're just trying to get free transformers, you know, from you. Uh, they've got a transformer that needs to be upgraded and rather than them doing it, they're just gonna charge you because they can, you know. Well, what the solar company told me is that they're trying to see if the solar, if, if the utility company is gonna pay for it, if not, they will, do the they will cover it if it's not above a certain amount but they oh, said okay. we will not pay for it but it's yeah, just being lobbied around right now yeah transformers can be pretty expensive like you know three to five thousand bucks so yeah yep okay well that doesn't sound good so anybody else have have a similar or better experience i can tell you that just from my experience on the one that we're installing here at our office, um, during the period of time I've been waiting on AEP to get approval, we have gotten permits from the city and we've actually applied for and received a REAP uh, grant from the federal government. 
So it seems strange that you can apply for a grant, get funding from the grant during the same period of time that you're trying to wait for the utility to allow you to submit an application. So uh, that that is a system that's definitely broken. So now I feel better. I've sufficiently ranted. So, <laughs> so anyway, let's jump in. Uh, the item that I picked here for today was um, selecting solar panels. What, what are some of those that are out there? And I do get this question a lot from folks, like which are the best solar panels? Which panel should I use? Um, I will tell you in today's market, the panel you'll select is the one you can get. You know, that's kind of uh, a, a guidance there. When you talk to your local distributor, they may only have three or four panels that are available to you. So you can use some of this as a guideline, but unless you've got a lot of time and a lot of patience and a lot of contacts with distributors, uh, it may not be overly helpful, but hopefully it'll give you some, some background. So what will you look for when you're looking at it? Well, of course you want a performance um, you know, from that solar panel. Some people get confused. You'll hear panels often referred to as tier one, tier two, tier three. Um, the assumption is tier one panels are better than tier two or tier three. That is not a true assumption. It, it really is refer referring to the financial health of the company that manufactures these. It's a, it's a uh, Bloomberg rating, I think, or, or one of those financial ratings. So um, really tier one just says that company is in better financial health or has been around longer or whatever, but it, it has nothing to do with the quality of the panel. Um, then there is uh, durability. I think really what you're looking for primarily is gonna be um, price, it's going to be a warranty service and, and of course, functionality. Now, a lot of these panels will um, market themselves. They'll, they all have their own little technical nuance that they're trying to uh, tell you their panels are better because, but as long as they're UL certified, uh, they're going to be the minimum thresholds that you're looking for. Some of the panels really are centered on uh, durability, like they will withstand high winds and um, hail events better than others. So you may want to look at that if you're in an extreme heat or, or a, a weather event location somewhere near a coast or in Texas where you get big hail storms, something like that. And, and then oftentimes people will look at the um, temperature coefficient. If you're in an area where you have high heat events, let's say you're in the desert Southwest, you may want a solar panel that is less um, sensitive to changes in temperature. And at, at which point then you're gonna get better production during hot periods of time. Uh, so that's something to look at. Um, there are a number of trends that are happening in the solar um, panel industry. One is um, pretty much all the panels I looked at in the higher quality range are, are what they refer to as black on black. They're really beginning to just sort of look like a solid sheet of black glass. And, and aesthetically, it's considered much more pleasing. You're not seeing a lot of the cell definitions. You're not seeing wires. Uh, it's all just a flat black surface there. Uh, another thing that's really becoming apparent is there is no standard size. Um, we used to have 60 cell and 72 cell panels. Then for the bigger ones, they got into 96. And now you're getting into, of course, the half cut cells, but the cells themselves are not a standard size anymore. The number of cells are beginning to see a larger range. So um, when you're doing your design of your um, system, it's much more important that you know exactly what panel you're going to be using because the racking system might change and, and you might have to go to a different size racking um, because of the dimensions of the panels. You can't just assume this is a standard 60 cell panel, this is a standard 72, and one is going to work and I'll worry about availability later. You're going to have to really, when you're doing using the software to design the system, you're going to have to know what panel you're using. Also, as we mentioned earlier, the American-made issue um, 
is is a thing. Um, you know, we need to know what panels are now going to be considered as American made to meet the IRA um, tax incentive credit. And I did a little bit of research today again, trying to find out if the American made tax credit is transferable to um, residential systems. And I cannot find anything definitive at all out there in, in the internet world saying, yes, it is. Uh, I have heard some webinars where the manufacturers saying, we think it may be that residential installations will qualify for the American made, but I can't find anything to corroborate that. So um, if, if someone knows more on that, that'd be helpful, but we'll keep looking. And also, um, you know, I'm still waiting for the panel manufacturers to sort of put their little seal on their advertising and say, yes, we qualify. So the IRS just came out with the guidance this week. So maybe that will begin to, uh, to happen in the advertisements. And then, as I mentioned, availability is a big issue. Um, as I started looking at some of these, uh, looking for prices on the various panels so we could compare them, some of these panels I just couldn't find available anywhere. So, um, you know, I'm sure they're available, but but not widely so. So what are the top 10 solar panel manufactured out there um, worldwide? Well, Longi, uh, Chinese panel there. Uh, some of these are not overly familiar. I'm not familiar with uh, Tong Wei, Tong Wai. Um, JA Solar, yeah, that's widely available. I don't know, I, I, I co, um, Trina Solar, we've heard Jinko, widely available. Canadian Solar, um, uh, Zangi SunTech, First Solar. First Solar is, of course, the um, thin film panel manufacturer here in Ohio. Uh, that's up there in the top 10 worldwide. When we look at which panels are most popular here in the United States, well, REC Solar is, is number one there, at least in uh, the beginning of last year. Panasonic, number two, Silfab, number three, Aptos Solar Technology, LA Solar, SunPower, then Canadian Solar, Boviet, Solaria, and then all others just kind of round it out. So if you're wondering which ones sell best, there's your group. Um, oh, sorry, Q cells. I skipped over Q cells. Q cells is actually the number one um, selling panel in the US, followed by REC, REC. All right, so which panels are assembled in the United States? So I'm making the assumption right now, these are probably panels that would qualify under the um, under that 10% tax credit, but I don't want to say that for certain. Um, First Solar, I know definitely they do qualify. So does Toledo Solar, but both of those are, are thin film panels and First Solar will not sell to uh, residential. Um, they're, they're really utility scale only. Plus um, they're sold out really through 2028. So you're not gonna be able to buy them anyway. Few cells, there is a manufacturing plant in Dalton, Georgia. So you, uh, you know, even though they would qualify, I guess, if you get panels from that plant. Jinko has a Jacksonville, Florida manufacturing. Um, LG Solar is discontinued. Uh, there's Loomis, they're not a big one. Mission Solar, San Antonio, Texas. Uh, they, they come up on some lists. Solaria, um, Solar Tech, Tesla, of course, Tesla roof, solar roof. Good luck with that. They, that's really a non thing. Um, Hylene, um, and then Silfab and Oxen. Oxen Solar is is um, U.S. manufactured. Now that's the list of of U.S. Facilities. I know Q cells announced they they've got a plant coming up in Pataskala. There's a lot of these plants being being put out there. And for instance, just because you bought a Q cell and they have a plant in in Georgia doesn't necessarily mean that the panel you bought was manufactured there. So you're going to have to have to do the research on that. 
Then um, looking at a bunch of these lists online as to what would be considered one of the best, you know, they, the best is always a bit subjective there. So I pulled up a number of these lists just to give you a sense of it. So um, how other people are, are uh, ranking them. Sun power, sun power solar panels come out on top on quite a few of these lists as the top uh, solar panel, um, but uh, they're also very pricey. And as I'll point out here a little bit later, I could not find availability of them. Panasonic, number two, Q cells, Canadian Solar and REC Solar from Forbes. When we look at Market Watch, they came up with Sun Power, Silfab, Panasonic, Q cells, and Canadian Solar. Very similar lists there. Uh, another company, so Save on Energy, Q cell, REC Solar, Panasonic, Silfab, and Sun Power uh, was their rating. EcoWatch, Sun Power, Q cell, Trina Solar, REC, and Panasonic. So the same names keep coming up on a lot of these lists. Sun Power, Q cell, REC, Panasonic come up a lot. Uh, Energy Sage, Sun Power number one, REC Solar, um, Panasonic, Q cell, and Silfab. And then there's a nice video online from uh, Group Solar Surge. And they were a little bit different. And I tended to give them a little more sway only because they're, met, they're installers who are rating these, not publications, you know, so they had some real world reasons for this. REC Solar was number one, Aptos number two, QCell, Silfab, and Jinko. So that, that was where theirs were. Um, some of the issues that the magazines kind of discounted was price. Panasonic, quite, a, quite pricey compared to the others. And this is certainly not scientific where I came up with these prices. Um, what I did is I just went through various distributors trying to find what they were actually charging and then getting a per watt cost on that. Um, so, so these are somewhat random, but hopefully somewhat reflective. Uh, Panasonic, they were $1.21 per watt just for the panels. Um, Hue cells found those for around 69 cents. Uh, Trina Solar around 69, Silfab around 69, REC Solar 60 cents. So those are all fairly comparable. Sun Power, I couldn't find any. I couldn't find prices. I couldn't find distributors of them. Um, you know, I didn't work, look for hours, but I certainly looked for 20, 30 minutes um, on this, and, and I could not find Sun Power available. So. And I did see in the articles, they're considered the most expensive. So certainly more than Panasonic. Then um, some of the other issues uh, that you're gonna be looking at here is uh, warranties. And pretty much all of the top panels are gonna offer you in the neighborhood of about 25 year warranties. So that's fairly comparable across the industry. And then the temperature coefficients, that's another thing if you're in a high heat area. And some of them like Panasonic and REC, they have a temperature coefficient of around 0.25% or 0.26% per degree Celsius. Um, the average temperature coefficient for solar panels is gonna be closer to around 0.4%. And, and really what that means is that the hotter it gets, um, the smaller the number means the less loss. So um, a panel like REC or Panasonic is going to have less loss in extreme heat conditions than a panel that has a 0.4% uh, temperature coefficient. So that was my study of that. Um, anybody have any comments or anything to add about the various solar panels that are out there and available? Yeah, Pete, I see your hand. Um, would you tell us what you think of dual cell panels where it's basically two strings of 72 cells in series in one panel? I have some thoughts, but I want to hear your thoughts first. Are you talking like split cell? Um, is yes. that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, or dual cell, yeah. Yeah, I think the split cell, of course, like oftentimes your half cell where you've got 144 versus 72 but they're half cells connected. You, you basically have um, double 
the bypass diodes um, so that the idea is shading is going to be, uh, the effect of shading is reduced a bit because if, if one area is affected, normally you're going to see there are like three bypass diodes in a solar panel. Now you're going to have six. So only one sixth of the panel will be affected if they're shading on a part of the panel. Also, be, because you shortened the string, uh, the wire length within the cells themselves, there's a little bit less loss due to resistance. You know, the, the junction boxes are usually right in the middle of the panel versus up at one end. And just the fact that the wire is running shorter distances, that's such a tiny bit, but any little bit helps. So I guess if the price is reasonable, the price per watt is reasonable, I mean, seems like a good thing. Do you have a, a different experience? Um, not experienced, but it occurs to me that's twice as many connections in the panel that can fail over the life of the panel. Yeah. And and I'm thinking in a lot of applications, especially string applications with a string inverter, if either half fails, the panel will need to be replaced because of the limiting current. Right. So, yeah. So that strikes me as um, negative value to the consumer. And it's certainly more work for the manufacturer to put together twice as many connections as a typical 72 cell panel. So I had the thought, and uh, some of us kids around the campfire came up with this. If a panel is put together and half of it is good and half of it's bad, instead of recycling it, that gives the manufacturer the opportunity to sell it into a third world market instead of paying for the cost of recycling the panel. So we think that's what's going on. Is they're now using smaller cells to some extent, cutting good ones and bad ones in half and saving the good half and putting panels together that have some value if only half of it works. Whereas, of course, on 72 whole cells, if it doesn't work, the whole thing's done. Yeah, I, I guess I can understand. Um, my guess is, though, that would not be motivation enough to retool your factory. It, it may be a consequence of these changes, but um, you know, all these solar panel manufacturers are trying to eke out some little competitive advantage. And, and so they try different things and some of them become industry standard because the cost of doing it is, is so marginal. You know, I'm thinking of like perk cells where you've got the back reflectivity that was an innovation that's now kind of standard on all panels. Um, the half cut cells, if the price per watt is similar, um, you know, they're going to be under warranty. So you'll get a replacement if it fails, but that's still annoying. You still have to go up and replace it. So, so that's always, uh, it's sort of like microinverters. Yeah, they'll replace them, but you still got to go, um, you know, replace the thing. And if it's up on a, on a roof, it's it's a task. It's a job to to do it. So um, I don't know. I, I I it's fun. I mean, fun to worry about why they would do such a thing. But my guess is they're just trying to eke out some little competitive advantage. So, okay, sounds good. Yeah, another innovation that we're seeing in solar panels right now is um, well, I thought you at first you were going to be talking about this was uh, tandem solar cells where they put a second layer and what they're focused on is perovskite over silicon. So now you've got a multi-junction panel uh, and they're really looking at um, how, how to increase the efficiency, excuse me, the efficiency of the panel um, under by, by doing a multi-layer panel. And, and I saw there was an announcement this week that uh, First Solar bought a company that does perovskite, and they're looking at putting a perovskite layer over top of their um, thin film panels to, to get more efficiency. Um, with a single junction silicon solar panel, there is what's referred to as the Shockley Quasar limit, I believe, which is around 32% efficiency. That's the theoretical maximum that a single junction silicon panel can, can hit. When you start throwing this second layer, that raises up to about 45%. So, so theoretically, you can eke out another 13, 14% just by putting a layer of perovskite on top of, of that cell. And in theory, an infinite number of layers, now, 
how that happens, I don't know, could have a theoretical efficiency rate of 86.8%. So when we're talking about, at least with today's technology, what is the upper, upper limit? It, it can go much higher than what we're seeing today. I mean, currently the, the most efficient single silicons are gonna be down around 24%, somewhere in there, although the record for a two-layer tandem is right now 32.5%, but it has a theoretical of 45%. So that's something that uh, keep your eye on, um, perovskite being superimposed on top of silicon. That may soon be the standard module in a year or two or three. Any other comments from the group? All right. Well, hearing none, I guess uh, we'll call it a day, and I'll see you guys later. All right. See you next Tuesday. Bye-bye.